got another gentleman here. I'll try to give you eight or ten minutes. Eight or ten minutes. All right. All right. Uh, just set your clocks. And, uh, let's start off. My name is Peter Livingston. Uh, on, I was not in uh, the Pacific. I was in, over here in, in uh, Area 18 eating alkali dust and ate a lot of that. In fact, uh, most of our, our, you know, we had fatigues. I'm, I'm the Air Force. I was the, uh, 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 was the officer of record for our little research group. I was an Air Force lieutenant at the time. And we wore fatigues, but you couldn't really tell it because we were all kind of gray uh, after eating a lot of dust. I was, we participated in two surface shots, Little Feller 1 and Little Feller 2, which were yep. uh, sub-kiloton type devices. And in particular, one of those is, is memorable because it was a show shot. And it turns out that we had Maxwell Taylor, Paul Maxwell Taylor with his helmet carefully polished by gum. You could get blinded by looking at the sunlight off his helmet. And there was Bobby, uh, Bobby Kennedy was there. And then all of the girls from, uh, you know, from uh, Brown and Root or one of the, uh, uh, one of the site uh, uh, contractors, they had actually, they had porta potties. We've been peeing in the field for so long I can't recall, but you know, a potty was really something because we never had potties. We just did what we could you know, with what we had. Uh, we were in the field most of the time. What we were about is this. I was uh, uh, the leader of a group to measure, in the case of the little feller shots, something called EMP, which you heard about. And it turns out that in order to make this measurement, we had to surround ground zero with a big cable about that thick about two miles in, in diameter. And uh, we uh, co connected this cable together, made a big circle, and uh, we recorded the current using a magnetic uh, tape recorder at the time. <laughs> a little, little wrinkle. Turns out in those days, we didn't have uh, garage door openers and good things like that. So in order to get your equipment to work, you had to have, God forbid, lines, you know, a telephone line that went you know, a mile away to your, to your control bunker. I actually have pictures of those bunkers here I brought with me that were official photographs taken at the site, and I will turn them over to, uh, uh, to the historians here so that they can put it in the record. But Thank anyway, you. these uh, timing lines you had to destroy before the bomb went off, because if you didn't, the EMP you were trying to measure got into those lines and would screw up your equipment, sure as I'm standing here. So uh, <laughs> what you had to do, and this is why it was called Prime Accord Peak, I used to have rolls of Primacord wrapped around me this way, sort of like a bandolier. And we'd wind the Primacord around the timing line. And when the countdown came down, we blew up the timing lines about five seconds before the shot would go off. Then, then the, our equipment was running and everything was fine. And the, you know, the weapon went off. We made our measurements and everything fine. Uh, but there was this one time, and this was what I was telling you about uh, you know, Maxwell uh, uh, Taylor and his shiny helmet and everything and the show shot. Well, it turns out that the general in charge was an army general whose name I've mercifully forgotten over the years. He wore pink, you know, can you imagine uh, uh, World, World War II, pre-World War II, the cavalry uniforms had sort of these pink, pink. Uh, uh, pants. They were pink. They were pink. Yeah. And he had a pair of those on. So he was walking around. He was a, he was a you know, significantly only a, a, a brigadier general. I, I can understand why. <laughs> anyway. Uh, it turns out that uh, they had to fire a couple of uh, timing rounds to be sure that the, uh, uh, that the uh, recoilless rifle team got the, got the bird where it's supposed to go. Well, yeah, they kind of made a mistake and came up 200 yards short, and guess what? Smack on top of our timing line. So I grabbed my number one, who isn't here, I, uh, Sandy Bumgartner uh, is, would, would be here, perhaps will be here tomorrow. Anyway, uh, we drive out and go fix the timing lines. And the general said, got on the radio, uh, uh, son, you can't go out there. But sir, but sir, our timing lines, you know, there's an experiment, you know, $300,000 worth of experiment. Can't do that, son, got to come back. Why is that? Because there's unexploded ordnance out there. <laughs> Shit, we've been working in the field for, you know, six to eight, you know, weeks solid. And had we, if we were going to be blown to breakfast because of unexploded ordnance, we would have been blown to breakfast, but we weren't. <laughs> And it turns out that, that, you know, what the general was doing was covering his butt because uh, he didn't want anything to go wrong. He didn't want me to screw up what was coming up to be the big show shot. Well, the shot occurred, the equipment didn't work, and I, was, uh, I remember at least got, getting so angry because we had no sleep, 
We had been in the field so long, I had picked up a shovel, and I was going to part that general's hair with a shovel. That was at a time, by the way, I decided that maybe I would just stay in the reserves and not take that regular commission. And so, indeed, I did resign eventually and, and was, was honorably discharged. But anyway, that's the story of the timing line fiasco. But uh, we did get measurements, and I should say that the positive side of the story is we did get measurements on other things. And it turns out that we used, uh, I did the theory, so I'm, I'm well aware of what went on. But you know, in, in uh, solving Maxwell's equations, uh, was able to develop a good expression for the near fields, which were the issues that we were looking at. And we used that information, ultimately, uh, others did, I didn't, but others made use of that to defend the Cheyenne Mountain NORAD site against EMP. So the NORAD site was, was fully defended back in the, oh gosh, I would put that in the middle 60s. And it was very carefully done so that not only was the site defended against uh, uh, mechanical and thermal and radiation effects, but also against EMP. Also, there was a big program at, uh, you know, obviously, a classified program at uh, Sandia Base, which was next to Kirtland at the time. Now it's all one. Yeah. But that time it was, uh, and they had uh, large aircraft and, the, and they had a Marks Bank, which is a device for producing really high voltage and high currents uh, next to it when they would discharge this thing and they would measure EMP uh, in the, e communications equipment and all the rest of that. So there was a lot of measurements of EMP and, and anybody who's interested in the theory, I can tell you about how it works, how it's related to atomic uh, dimensions and all of that because I've worked on all of that uh, from first-hand basis. I'm not going to bore you with it now. Anyway, that's that shot. Then I'll have to tell you my, tu my uh, uh, tunnel shot experiences. I watched one of the stemming failures, the first one, and Peter, all the stuff come out of the tunnel. Can you get closer to the mic, please? Oh, sorry. Uh, well, I, you know, I have another story to tell, but I'd like to get other people up here. But the story is uh, one of the early tunnel shots and about what happens when uh, there is something called a stemming failure, which means that you don't shut down the tunnel fast enough uh, for one reason or another, and I know why. And all of the stuff in the tunnel comes out in slow motion, and you watch the rails and all of the coax, miles and miles of coax, and the Tektronix 519 scopes and all the cameras floating out and then slowly descending into the valley, finally followed by a puff of uh, radioactive dust and whatnot. And that's a IJK, com that was the IJK uh, complex. Yeah. IJK. Yep. So anyway. Up in, area, up, up, in, up in area 12. Yep, that's right. That's where it was. Anyway, that's the story. I'm going to stand down. Thank you. <laughs> thank, thank you so much. Go, go ahead. Uh, would you extend that to the first underground test? I'll, I'll tell my stemming story. That, uh... Come on up. I can tell you what he's going to talk about. It's the IJK complex at the Nevada Sess site at Area 12. And uh, we thought we had really uh, engineered steel doors and everything in the drift. And I got to tell you, they all came out the front portal pretty well, damn they quick. They certainly did. They, did, they, <laughs> and, they, they and, scrammed. They and those did. doors went across the valley. Well, let me Prob set, go let ahead. Me, let me set the stage for you a little bit. Turns out that, uh, of course, uh, surface testing uh, by treaty became after Little Feller 2. That was the last surface test uh, at the Nevada test site in this country, period. Now, we were immediately, and we had already started to develop underground testing because we at, at Kirtland Air Force Base had a mission, and our mission was to, to protect the assets that we had, our, our airplanes and other things. And there were a series of threats, and I've, I've already talked about the EMP thing. I'm going to leave that aside. And it turns out that another big subject was something called the X-ray effect. Now imagine if, uh, for example, you're a Soviet in those days, and you're launching an attack against us, and here comes this big bunch of missiles coming in. Well, what can you do about them? Well, one of the strategies was to send up a, a bomb on one of our missiles, blow it up, and then the radiation interacts with the uh, opponent's missiles and does something to make them inoperable either, uh, 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 it, there are ways that this happens, but one of them is clearly cause them to burn up before they can fully function, you know, burn up in the upper atmosphere by destroying the heat shield portion of the reentry cone. 
And there's something called the X-ray effect. And then what that is is that bomb goes off, produces a heck of a lot of X-rays and gamma rays. And these X-rays deposit in materials, causing it to swell almost instantly with heat, sending a, a wave of material back into the, uh, uh, away from the surface to the back edge, to the, to the back part of this certain material, causing it to break off. We call it spallation. And these pieces fly off in the inside of the weapon and screw it up thoroughly. At least that was the, that's the claim. And so I and others built codes you know, where we try to detect and, and, and predict these things. And so we did. We built our codes, and we predicted the heck out of it. Uh, but it wasn't good enough, because we have to test these things. Ah, So therefore, there was at least one and possibly more tests, underground tests, dedicated to this phenomenon. Now, an underground test is just what it says. It's a, uh, it took about mm, four months to drill a, a, a hole in the side of, a, of, a, of a, one of the uh, kind of hills that we have in, at the test site. Yeah, area 12. Area 12. And this is a tunnel, just like miners do. And it was built in the same way, large uh, walls. And there's a little railroad track that runs down the center. And that there is the end of this tunnel, which is about, oh gosh, uh, almost a mile into the, into the uh, underground, is the zero room where the weapon is placed. And you know, it has all of its uh, stuff that is fired from the surface of the ground and so on. Uh, but then uh, the idea was that we have a series of measurements we had a, some pipes that led from the zero room to various measurement stations to measure the uh, uh, radiation content as a function of time and various uh, means of measuring it. Oh, gosh. We used a lot of oscilloscopes. Uh, there was a wonderful tectronic scope called a 519, which is a gigantic thing. It had tubes in it and was the fastest thing alive. I mean, it, was, it, it could measure, gosh darn, microseconds. And that was big deal in those days in, in uh, you know, having a bandwidth that was megahertz, multi-megahertz bandwidth. That was really a wonderful instrument. We loved our 519s. You couldn't, couldn't tear them away from my dead gold fingers. My 519 is my life. Well, anyway, so we had lots and lots and lots of those stationed in this thing. Now, the, the idea was that what was going to happen is that the bomb was going to go off and sends a wave in the earth around it. And the idea was that this shock wave going through the, going through the earth was supposed to coalesce at the, uh, uh, some distance away from the ground, you know, from the zero room, and cause the tunnel to collapse before all of the, the gases and things that would be moving at sonic speeds could come out of this out of the zero room and, and get outside. And that was called stemming. And it was a calculation you had to do that had to do with the properties of the earth, uh, of, the, of the rock surrounding this room. And if you got that wrong, why uh, you calculate a speed that was wrong, why the gases had come out before, you, before the tunnel would collapse, and you'd have something called a, uh, a stemming disaster. And that's what happened. So because the calculations were based on really kind of raw data, we didn't have really good uh, data to describe how a shock wave propagated through that bunch of stuff, which is not any one rock, but it's a collection of rocks and sand and gravel and a bunch of other crap, why uh, the, t the, the, the stemming failed. And how did we know that? Kathump goes to the ground. We felt the ground move. OK, here it comes. And then slowly out of, we're across the valley now. It's about a mile and a half, two miles away. Out comes a long snake of coax cable bundled like this, just floating, falling down the valley. Then followed by that, pieces of, of railroad track. And then the equipment came out in, in large arcs, and just sort of. Uh, come out of the mouth of the tunnel and pause, and then fall in, you know, into the valley below. And eventually, out would come a great puff of, of, of gas and whatnot. And immediately, you know, we knew we had a stemming failure. And so the B-47s got up and, and would start tracking uh, the plume, which was uh, a, a real problem. It's what they, they were designed to do. But it turns out we got better at stemming calculations. I was part of a, a team that l looked at the, the hydrodynamics code development at the time, and we knew what the problem was. We just didn't have good data. Well, we got good data really quick, because as far as I know, that was the last time we had a stemming failure of that kind, although in 1970, 
when I wasn't there, and it was not anything, uh, in fact, it's reported on in, in your museum over here, there was a stemming failure for, that came through a vertical hole in which there was a, a, uh, a geyser of, of uh, rock and gas and whatnot that came out that did produce a very bad um, uh, fallout pattern, which, which we had to do. So anyway, I, that, that's the end of my stemming story, watching this stuff slowly float, as it were, out of the mouth of the tunnel and fall into the valley below, and you say, that was an oh, that moment. Well, I just want to add to him that what he had, what he just in, in talked about here is that uh, in Area 10 is where we had that particular event that uh, we had a fracture. There was a fracture. My, my memory serves me that it's about four to 500 feet away. There's a fracture in the earth. I have to admit, we have drilled three-inch core holes all over the dam test site, and we never found that fracture. Yeah. And, uh, and of course, when we fired that, it wasn't too far from Mary 12 camp, and we had people living in the camp. They were in bed. Sound, some of them were sound asleep because they were security guards. And, uh, yeah, you know, we fired it, and it wasn't very, you know, we found this weakest point, yeah. and it went right across. My memory serves me it's between three and 500 feet or maybe a little more. And uh, it come up out of the earth. And as he mentioned to you, the, yeah, we got all the dirty stuff that come out with it. And it went up and of course, uh, you know, we, we sent a team in to get all the people out of camp. I have to admit, we got some, some of the workers out of camp. They never even got their billfolds. They, they came out with their BVDs on and that was it. We put them in a bus and the way they went. Yeah, it was time. It was time to get out, and so uh, you know that's one of the. I, I guess I want to say one of the major accidents that we had. Uh, I don't. Know, were you affected with the Defense Nuclear Agency in any way? Uh, I was not. A, I was a captain at the time. Okay. I, I was actually serving. I was a hip pocket captain. I was okay. Serving as a first lieutenant. Uh, but uh, they were next to us. Okay. Yeah. I was stationed in Kirkland. And the AEC and all of that. DNA was over in, uh, yeah, at Sandy Base. Sandy on Sandy. Yes, sir. Right. Yeah, well, that's when. And that's where we had our connection with Sandy. Yeah. And Sandy had a lot of testing equipment, as I described earlier. Sure. On, on their property, and and we at Kirtland, uh, for the flying part, were mostly associated with trying to uh, improve the defenses of our B-47s, later B-50s okay. came in to be, you may uh, to be yeah, well, and to, uh, we, we did a lot of measurements on them, mm -hmm. EMP yeah. measurements, sure. and so we changed a lot of uh, B-52 and B-47 interior. Now, yeah, well, you, you may have been associated with their Air Force Tactical Air, uh, AFTAC. Yeah. Uh, I think it was called AFTAC, yeah. if I remember correctly, and uh, now, like some of the other things that we've had that, that you know, we started in uh, 1963, you know, the Nevada test site was basically uh, uh, kind of a, uh, a temporary site. And uh, Nick Aquilina and myself and a couple other people, we all went to Washington, D.C. and said to the, D to the AEC, you know, if you want us to continue testing, we got to have some permanent facilities. We just can't live in temporary persistence anymore. And so we started a big program and we <clears throat> in Mercury, oh my, we, we built um, maintenance shops and we built new cafeterias and, and we started building uh, the cinder block homes and, or I should say cinder block motel rooms, but you shared a bathroom between the two rooms. And uh, that was a major program, it really was. We built a new warehouse and um, uh, we also had the University of California that uh, was collecting a lot of animals and, and uh, across the desert. And uh, down in Mercury, we had a we had a particular warehouse that had a lot of glass into it. And I can remember going over there, and of course we had one big old rattlesnake over there, a big old black diamond one. And you know he was in cage, except for the top had holes in it, but the rest of it was glass. I got to tell you, when you walked up there and just start to put your hand up against that glass, man, he'd hit it and then he'd extract all that serum up. And and he was a big one. I mean, uh, when when I worked at um, uh, outside of Sandia Base, uh, there was another base 
up in the hills, Monzano. And uh, I worked as a security guard up there in 1951 and early 52. <coughs> and we weren't allowed to shoot them with a 45. So we all went downtown and bought a little revolver t with 22s into it. And we had, uh, we had sandbag revetments we'd get in. And uh, all of a sudden, it's 2 o'clock in the morning, and all you hear is this bzzz. <laughs> and you knew what it was. And so we'd put the flashlight on and pull that little old 22 out, and we'd get him. <laughs> Go ahead. Well, i got to tell you about that, too. Uh, you know, at Kirtland Air Force Base, we have a, uh, a uh, uh, part of our, our base wreck was a, uh, you know, was a gun shop where you could do it. <laughs> so my brother was serving in the military. He was uh, uh, an NCO, and I was, uh, you know, was, was, was an officer. But he'd come over. He was stationed somewhere up here in Nevada. He'd come down, and we'd go hunting. Uh, but what we do is we check out M1s out of the uh, out of the wreck shop, and we'd load our rounds uh, 130. We we would uh, take uh, we reload them as uh, for really fast hot uh, hot runs at 130. Uh, I think 130 grains. We loaded them up, and we'd go hunting rattlers. We put um, uh, coffee cans as leggings on our legs like this. Uh, because if you stepped into bushes where the, where the rattlers were, you could get struck. So our coffee cans and combat boots, and we go out and we had context. OK, there's a bush over there. OK, now you soften them up, and I'll catch them as they go out. So you know, John would he'd, he'd, he'd let a couple of rounds go into the bush. And sure enough, there'd be some kind of confusion and whatnot. And I'd get in there and take care of the rest of them. So, you know, we'd count up rattlers, so that was that was fun on the rainy days. What oh yeah, you know when when I was up at Manzano uh, as a young boy. We were down. We were, yeah. went over the other side of Sandia and do that. By the yeah. Way, so that was. Uh, I can remember at Manzano, uh, we had a young boy that was probably I said my memory serves me from Montana, and uh, you know we ran into some of those rattlesnakes, and uh, you know but when I was in in high school or even probably down in the seventh to eighth grade, we had what we call leather leggings that you put on above your boot or your shoe. And so I wrote my mother and said, send me my leather leggings. Because I said, you know, I, I want something to put above my shoe so that when that sucker hits my leg, he's not going to just get uh, you know, the tissue of my leg. He's going to get that leather first. And, uh, but anyway, this guy from Montana, one night, he shot this rattler, and then he was a, he, he said, you know, I like rattlesnake meat. And so he skinned him, and I got to tell you, put him on a, it was a piece of plywood, it was about 14 inches wide, and over seven foot long, and when we stretched him out, that skin skinned it out, the big portion of the belly was one foot across. He was one huge rattler. I don't know. I didn't eat any of it. <laughs> I've never eaten it. I've never eaten it. And so, but anyway, we were coming down off of Monzano one night. Uh, we had a six by six, and there was also a vehicle that had uh, kind of like a tank, only it had rubber tires onto it, and it had a, uh, a siren onto it and a red light. Did have a 50 caliber machine gun on top. <clears throat> Well, the kid was driving the six by six. We were coming down the hill because to get up to Monzano and get up where the storage uh, areas were, where you had bunkers all over the place, and uh, we're coming down off the mountain, and he threw the red light on us. And of course, the kid hit the brakes, and there were no brakes. And all the next thing we knew was, you know, on a six by six, you sat on the sidelines on the side of, of, the, of the six by six. He cut down with that 50 caliber machine gun, went right down through the center of that six by six. The engine quit running, and he, I don't know how this kid, you know, um, he had to help, have the help of the good Lord because he finally got that sucker in reverse on how, you don't normally get a truck in reverse going forward. It just doesn't happen. And he did it, and of course, uh, the kid later, he said, I'm sorry, I just, you know, and he said, I didn't realize that you didn't have any brakes. Well, he didn't know that, you know, poor guy. Uh, but I did work on Monzano. Monzano had, 
Oh, let's see. There was uh, the first fence was uh, just an ordinary cyclone fence. The second one was a cyclone fence. But you could drive your vehicle as a security guard. You could drive between those two fences. The third fence was a fence that had uh, uh, 220,000 volts in it. And then the fourth fence was on the inside of the, ta of the compound. And uh, you, you never drove between the, the, the heavy 220,000 volt one. You always drove on the inside. Uh, on the in, uh, outside, outside run between the first and second fence, and uh, yeah, we've had some experiences on that one too. Okay, so what year was this picture taken? The picture is taken in 1956. I was commissioned in August of 1956 in Waco, Texas, as a second okay. lieutenant. I since was given a deferment for four years where I finished my PhD at the University of Wisconsin. Went on active duty uh, January 8th, 1961. And I served on active duty from 1961 to 1964, stationed at Kirtland Air Force Base in the physics division. So that's, that's where, and I am, I am a, a, a physicist from that day to this. I mean, I was trained as a chemist, um, then gradually became a physicist in the grand, in the grand scheme of things. Still am, as a matter of fact, so. Um, so let me just finish this and sure. I can concentrate on your question. So I think probably rather than rattle on, what I'd like to do is to let you ask me questions and then go from there in order to have you control what you want uh, and I can respond, and et cetera. Sure, I'll be glad to do that. Um, so it is October 24th, 2015. Um, we are at the Atomic Testing Museum in Las Vegas. Um, and I'm speaking today with Peter Livingston. So um, Peter, we just put on tape a little bit of how you got started in the service. Would you start by telling us um, your connection with atomic testing. Sure. Um, as, as, you know, as you know, I went on active duty uh, assigned to Kirtland Air Force Base in 1961. Very cold, January 8th, 1961. Very cold. And uh, in that time, the physics division was primarily devoted to what are called weapons effects. And in fact, my uh, service number here was nuclear effects officer. So that was my assignment, so-called, that was my MOS. Uh, and um, these, this had various things. For example, um, one of the major concerns at the time was if the Soviets were to launch a major uh, a nuclear attack, how could we defeat their missiles before they struck us? And one of the things that, of course, emerged was that if, they, if a flood of missiles comes at us and we, we are able to launch a nuclear weapon in space and it goes bang, uh, various things happen to the enemy warheads. And if we can cause bad things to happen, and there's a variety of those, why then the warheads will fail and we are saved. So needless to say, a, a tremendous amount of research went into the details of how you go about making a warhead fail in space. Now, in order, uh, and of course, as a theoretician at the time, I was involved with a lot of modeling of various kinds of things that go with that. At this, to this date, even though it was 50 years ago, I'm not sure about the classification status, so I'm just going to say that, that there are a number of mechanisms that we explored. But quite obviously, in order to find out if our models meant anything, we had to test these models. Ah, but where could you test them? Well, needless to say, uh, Nevada test site was one. So I was assigned over a course of time to, the net, to a research team here, which I was given as a, as a ranking officer. I had a team of people uh, come and work with me on measuring an effect, in this case, not having to do with warheads, but having to do with another thing that you've heard about, so-called electromagnetic pulse. Electromagnetic pulse devices where uh, you know, people have talked about weaponizing them, and they can be weaponized. And the Soviets had a, later on after I left the service, had a 
missile in their inventory, which was a, was a, a device that, that did that, and we also had them as well. Uh, but this effect, and, and we devoted ourselves to measuring this EMP effect and on the surface tests of the Little Fellers 1 and 2 in this project, uh, in this operation, Dominic. And uh, there were many things that were accomplished in those tests, and I'm not aware of all of them, but I am aware of what it is that we were interested in. And the story here goes back to the original Operation Trinity in New, in New Mexico. It turns out that when the weapon went off, um, many, uh, a lot of equipment in those days uh, had to be controlled by, by wires that turned them on and turned them off and so forth. And it was found that a lot of the wires uh, and the equipment to which they were attached were destroyed. Uh, they, uh, as if they had just burned up through tremendous currents. And so naturally the question came about where did these tremendous currents come from? Obviously they're associated with a nuclear blast. Well, we know now how they, they came about. I, I did some of the original modeling of that and it turns out that Maxwell's equations are, are coupled with atomic bomb physics actually give you a pretty good estimate of what to expect for things like that. So again, that was one of the things that we had to do was to go about building a measurement scheme to measure the electromagnetic pulse introduced in a large uh, cable uh, about that thick that, was, uh, that surrounded ground zero with a diameter of about two miles. And so we had a recorder, a tape recorder device to measure the current in this cable loop uh, during the atomic bomb uh, burst. And uh, that was something that we could predict. And so uh, the idea was to measure it and then see how well we did with our predictions and adjust our model accordingly. Well, we did that and found out that agreement was pretty good. Um, so the model that I developed and other people worked on after I did was applied to, the, to uh, uh, protecting the NORAD uh, Cheyenne Mountain site uh, against electromagnetic pulse uh, damage from nuclear weapons should there be a horror upon horror of nuclear exchange, why the NORAD site would survive, not only the mechanical, uh, uh, mechanical effects and radiation effects, but also this EMP effect. So sure enough, uh, you know, that was done. And EMP effects were studied in aircraft and missiles and a whole bunch of other things. There was a test site right at Sandia, uh, uh, a Sandia base, which was next to Kirtland in the time, and uh, now it's all it's now all Kirtland Air Force Base. But in those days, there was a test site with, uh, with large uh, generators, Marks Banks in particular, that were used to create the kind of pulses that, that one might see induced in airplanes and missiles and that sort of thing. So that was one of the things that I was involved with, is, is building and testing and uh, developing a model for this EMP effect. The other, the X-ray effect, which I had mentioned to you before, has a phenomenon that has to do with how nuclear weapons interact with <coughs> missile shields, missile, the nose cones of missiles. And those tests were conducted underground in tunnels. Uh, and uh, I was part of the measurement team because, uh, again, there was a certain model that I was working on. Uh, those tests were conducted and, and we got results from those as well that went into our calculations and so on. But there were a lot of stories to tell about the underground tests as well as the surface tests. And, you know, I could go on and on, but I've given you uh, a, a raison d'etre at least for both of those kinds of tests. So the, the EMP, I think, is something EMP. that's familiar to most people yes. in concept at least. Yes. Um, probably mm -hmm. somewhat mm -hmm. fictionalized, but nevertheless. Mm -hmm. So can you explain a little bit more sure. about the X-ray effects? Yes, basically what happens there is that if I have a, uh, a nose cone made of some absorbent material, remember a nose cone is a large amount of carbon and other things that are, that are, are, are deflagrated or worn away as the missile comes through the atmosphere and the outer surface burns away and you have this big, uh, this bright, you see this, the flame coming back and all of that. Well, that's designed that way and th that th it is expected a certain amount of surface will be eroded away by the re-entry. And that's fine so long as it protects the interior parts and they get to the delivery point and things go bang, why everything is fine. 
On the other hand, if you have a, if you have a nuclear weapon in space and it goes off, it'll deposit uh, X-rays and gamma rays, X-rays primarily, in that same region, causing uh, um, things to happen to that material so that it actually will break up. It's, it, as we say, it spallates, it produces a compression wave, which will go back and, 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 and spring material off the back surface of it and kind of make a mess of everything inside. Well, we, we know about how that works. We know the, the equations that, that govern it. Uh, we have made, uh, uh, their laboratory measurements could be made to support this effect, but ultimately we had to test it. Uh, and so that's one of the tests were uh, to test for this phenomenon uh, at the test site. Uh, the person in charge of most of that, I think, was Don Lamberson, Captain Lamberson, who later became a general, uh, General Lamberson, a four-star general in the, in the U.S. Air Force. Uh, in fact, uh, Jack Welch, my superior, his captain at the time, uh, also became a uh, three-star general and I believe retired as the head of DIA. So uh, I've come from and these were people who were non-pilots. That was the big thing in those days. Uh, all of us at the research lab, with the exception of the head, were people who didn't fly airplanes. We were physicists and that sort of things. And there was, uh, we felt, a fair amount of discrimination against non-pilots so that if you wanted to make the highest ranks in the Air Force and didn't fly, that was an added hurdle that you had to overcome by being really good at what you were doing. And sure enough, uh, these two gents that I mentioned were good at what they did. So did the Air Force actively recruit physicists for these programs? No, I wouldn't say so. Uh, what actually did the recruiting was uh, Korea. And the choice of being drafted in 1952 or joining ROTC, which I did, and getting a commission, and then serving at, in some more regulated manner and in a way, I knew that I was going to be a good scientist, and I have been. Um, so it was a choice I made to go through the ROTC route, get my commission, and not go to Korea. And were there multiple science groups? How many people were involved in this kind of um, well, in, in research my... to... To oh sort Lord, of expand uh, that's, uh, I would say the the physics division at Kirtland Air Force Base probably had 50 or 60 people in it, uh, of which uh, the people that I knew in my own branch, there was probably eight or nine. Uh, there were people, for example, uh, our people also conducted the Project Starfish measurements uh, in the Pacific Ocean where a bomb was hoisted at high altitude. They were studying such things as what happens when you inject a plasma into the Earth's magnetic field. We did some of the very first work on the Van Allen belts, as a matter of fact, as a means of anticipating what would happen if a bomb went off and interjected a plasma, injected a plasma into the Earth's magnetic field. It would represent quite a mirror for, uh, for communications. In fact, it would block any kind of communications that had to go up to say the D layer, because this went off much lower than the D layer is. So, and it did. It, it shut down communications worldwide for a couple of days. The big question of the time that we studied, or our people that I knew studied, was how, how long, what was the decay time? Yeah, you could inject this stuff in there, but it, it, you know, the, the plasma had to leak out from the ends of this confinement region, you know, over the poles. And, and it had to dissipate somehow, and there was a rate you know, at which it dissipated, and obviously the faster it dissipated, the more rapidly communications would be established. You couldn't control that. That was, that was just the way it was. So, so it's a function of what the yield of the weapon was, of course, and I don't know, the, I don't know that data. But I do know that that was a question, how long this is going to last, and whether you know, if it shuts down communication for a week or a day. If it's a day, it's different than if it's a week. And of course, in those days, the key point is that a lot of uh, uh, long distance communications was conducted by HF and VHF uh, uh, radio. Now we have satellites all over the place. And so those same considerations wouldn't apply as they, as they did then today. So it's a different story. We lived in the world we lived in, which was a radio dominated uh, universe, but today, 
we have things that aren't radio, uh, um, such as optics and whatnot, that also carry a tremendous amount of communication. And quite in, and optical systems are quite in, insensitive to EMP, as a matter of fact. By definition, they don't have any wires in them. So would you say that this would, this research that you were doing and your colleagues were doing was both offensive and defensive? No, it was primarily defensive. Very, very strictly related to the problem of defending against what we thought was a Soviet threat. Oh, I haven't asked my question quite right. Are, were you trying to figure out what we should do to our communications for example, to protect them, and at the same time trying to figure out what we could do to disrupt the communications of the I enemies. Would, I would say that we were concerned about our, our own communication channels and what were the alternatives to the long distance communications. We had under, underwater cables then, you had point to point transmission that wouldn't use uh, reflection from the ionosphere. Uh, and, you know, and, and it could well have been, and I don't know this as a fact at all, I'm speculating, it could well have been to simulate or to stimulate uh, uh, so-called UHF or, or a, a high frequency communication, microwave communication from point to point to point, which would uh, be invulnerable uh, to this kind of problem. So um, how it developed, that is to say what the fallout uh, uh, forgive the pun, the fallout from this particular research, I don't know and I can't assert with any, uh, any validity as to how it showed up, except that I know today that it's a different story. Okay. Um, so when you talked about coming to the test site and putting this cable all around mm -hmm. the test, mm -hmm. um, how many people were in your team that uh, did that? It was myself, uh, uh, Sandy Bum, Bumgartner should be here uh, tomorrow. He's unfortunately, uh, his, his sad story is that he's now in stage four cancer that he developed from, uh, uh, from actually taking packages out of, the, out of contaminated ground uh, during uh, these tests. And he, would be, he sat, as he said, he sat on the edge of the hole while extracting a package. Well, unfortunately, that contact was enough to allow him to be thoroughly irradiated by, um, you know, some of the fallout which got stuck to his clothes, and, and uh, he's uh, suffering from cancer, which is, you know, he's alive, but not doing well. Uh, he'll be here, uh, and, and uh, you can talk with him, but he worked for me. Uh, and I had a team of about, mm, I would say, six people, of which Sandy was one. Um, and there were other technicians. Sandy was a, I think he was a specialist second class, I think. Um, but he was sort of the, kind of the sergeant. Uh, I, you know, Sandy was always sort of my sergeant in that regard. Interesting enough, he left the, he, when he left the service, he went on to school and became an astronomer. So he has his PhD in astronomy. Um, just interesting how that works. But uh, the, uh, I was known as Prime Accord Pete uh, because in those days we didn't have uh, wireless garage door openers to turn our equipment on and off. And, the only, and so we had to run uh, telephone wires to our equipment to send the signals to start them you know, before the test and so on. Well, it turns out you couldn't have uh, large runs of wire in the ground because the EMP would get into it and kill your equipment uh, uh, so that it wouldn't work properly. So what you had to do was you had to turn the equipment on and then you wrapped Primacord around the uh, timing lines and blew up the timing lines in a big boom and then the bomb would go off and then your equipment would happily run until it ran out of battery or whatever and you could get you in, and after a while you could extract your, your uh, magnetic tape recordings which we did. So, but you know, you had to have a lot of prime accord. So I used to have wear a, a bandolier of prime accord, red prime accord around me, and I was known as Prime Accord Pete. When we got bored, uh, why we'd take some prime accord and some, de uh, you know, some detonators, and we'd blow up patches of uh, see how high we could blow a, a sagebrush uh, by by just putting a circle of prime accord around it, and going gaboom, and watching how high it sailed. Uh, that's what we did when we were bored. So how many um, 
of these kinds, like, or how much time did you spend at the test site doing these kinds of uh, tests? Well, certainly six months at a quack. Uh, that was that was typical, and there were periods of time. You know, again, I, I went back to uh, after the after the small boy tests, uh, the little feller shots. As a matter of fact, interestingly enough, I've got a picture. I think uh, these I'm going to turn into. Uh, these are if you look in the back of these, many of these are some of these are duplicates. But these are pictures that were taken at the site, and they are they are official pictures. Oh yeah. Uh, uh, so that you can see what what the what it looked like. And here's that's me as a younger person. Oh dear, I didn't think I'd ever be that young. And uh, in specific, you won't notice that, but the person there that's technician, that's me. Uh, if you look at the profile, kind of, uh, that's me. And the other piece of information I have is uh, this one, which actually is on the net. Uh, I looked at it and I said, holy Toledo, I recognize that. Let me show you this. Um, yeah. Uh, if you look at the bottom, there's little feller two. Yes. And it's on the web, and I stand, I'm stand. i standing in the group on the right somewhere. I don't know which, which of the people it is. So, six months at a time, well, Every you know, year for well, how many it was a, years? it was six months at a time for over a period of two years, um, and it was a, a, you know sixty days in the field without you know seven you know seven days a week. So later on in your career, mm -hmm. um, would you like to talk a little bit about sure. some of the other kinds of things that you did? Well, uh, yeah, um, I mean, there's a lot of things I. The experience I had in the Air Force was, I think, really pivotal. Um, when I, before I went into this, I, I, into on active duty, I was uh, trained in, in uh, theoretical chemistry. My PhD thesis was on a was kinetic theory of non-spherical molecules, and I had a very, very fine uh, a, a major professor who taught me a lot of applied mathematics, which has stood me well from that day to this. So I've considered myself a, an applied mathematician and published uh, one paper at least in applied mathematics. Um, so that was good, but somehow, I, you know, adding another decimal point to already understood thing didn't really excite me too much. So when I went into the service, I was kind of a, a blank slate. I thought, gee, you know, I'll see what's out here. Well, needless to say, I got involved in. The, the atomic bomb testing, as you can see here. I worked with a civilian scientist by the name of Dr. Stanley Cronenberg, and uh, he was very interested in looking, ultimately looking for monopoles uh, in uh, Arctic sea ice, uh, which was his major thing, but he had to uh, conduct uh, uh, experimentation uh, uh, looking at the X-ray signatures of fireballs. And so he and I uh, uh, developed a, a new proportional counter, which we published in Applied Op in the Journal of Applied Physics. I have that article somewhere. So I've done that with him, uh, worked on, on that. Okay, so I learned something about radiation physics. Um, then I got interested uh, in the Air Force in the brand new, th brand new subject of lasers, which was... Uh, which we were tasked with determining what kind of impact um, a laser beam would have on a material. Could you break it up with a laser beam? How intense a laser beam could you get? And so forth and so on. Well, the initial ideas of using a ruby laser to make a laser weapon, which was at the time on top of it, turned out not to work for a whole bunch of technical reasons. Uh, but that got me interested in lasers. and so. After leaving the service, I went back for a year postdoc to the University of Wisconsin where I published a couple of papers, still trying to figure out what I was doing. Spent some time at the, Inter uh, at the Institute for Defense Analysis, IDA, in Washington, D.C., uh, and then got appointed as, uh, as Associate Professor of Applied Physics at Catholic University where I taught for seven years. Uh, but even that was, uh, that was getting bound and you know, there were all kinds of Catholic politics having to do with 
people who were protesting in Humani Vitae, which was uh, a big source of, of struggle between theologians and, and people expressing academic freedom and, and uh, uh, loyalty to the church and so on. So that became a, you know, that became a big point, and I thought, gee, what, <clears throat> what's a nice guy like me doing in a mess like this? So I went off to work for the Naval Research Laboratory, became branch head, and then wound up here in California conducting a very large uh, integration experiment where we integrated a high-energy laser with a, uh, a, a very, very accurate pointer tracker that Hughes built and shooting down missiles with it in 1970, uh, 1978. So that was, and then I worked uh, for North, the TRW in Northrop Grumman for 33 years. Uh, developed a lot of patents. I have some 40 odd patents, so I've been an inventor and been dealing largely with uh, one of the pioneers in the high energy laser program in this country. Uh, certainly did that when I was at the Naval Research Laboratory. Uh, so I've, I've had my hand in high energy lasers and other things as well. But coming back full circle, to the experiments in Nevada set me to thinking in a very roundabout way, which I don't know if I want to go into bore you with here. I, I asked myself the question, well, what would I need to um, take a fuel rod from a nuclear power plant and deactivate it, cause all of its internal uh, uh, internal fissile material to fission all at once. Well, it turns out, this is the, where the high energy, really high energy laser comes in. I was working with colleagues at Stanford on developing a, a very, very, very high energy laser that, uh, uh, that produced very, very, very short photons, gamma ray photons. Well, it turns out that if you had such a device, you could use it to modify fuel rods, so as to get rid of the radioactivity all at once and come out as a big burst of energy, which you could use. But now, instead of having to store them in the ground for 500,000 years, you only have to put them away for a couple hundred. That would enable uh, nuclear power. That would enable fission nuclear power and get rid of the scary part about how you store this stuff for 500,000 years. I have a patent on it, um, and that was one of the last patents I filed with uh, Northrop Grumman when, before I retired. Having said that, uh, we still don't have the laser, and it may be some time before we do, but once we do, that's how it'll be done. And therefore, given that, we can see an end to having storage of uh, fuel rods forever. That got me to thinking about fuel rods. I thought, gee, what a waste. They're sitting there in these deep cooling ponds, heating up the water, radiating gammas all over the place, and nothing, it, nobody's doing anything with them. So. Uh, the next step and the last step is to combine that knowledge about gamma radiation which originated with these pictures here into something which is, I believe, and that's listed here, a revolutionary new idea which is to use radiation that is from uh, fuel rods in cooling ponds without moving them, without touching them, but conducting chemistry in the vicinity of those cooling rods to take carbon dioxide, which we have to capture, and turn it into a whole spectrum of useful chemicals that can be sold as feedstocks for the chemical industry. It's very profitable, and there, there, that is a brochure which tells you all about it. So full circle then is that the gamma radiation, which was the danger here, and that people are dying of, of, uh, of cancer from that gamma radiation, no doubt about it, it is dangerous. But then so is electricity. People are, are electrocuted all the time because they grab the wrong thing at the wrong time. Yet we have electric lights, we conduct lethal electricity through our houses, and we use it to benefit. Now, are there ways that we could use nuclear radiation from spent fuel rods to benefit, to do something useful that we want? And the answer is yes. Now, it's limited, much more limited than electricity. But in the area for which it does work, it works extremely well. That's what I have uh, drawn up here. And so that's the full circle from my experience in, uh, in, in, in Nevada. OK. Well, I want to thank you very much for taking the time to talk with us today and for sharing your experiences and um, 
your ideas and I want to thank you for your service as well. Okay. Um, and I want to ask you if there is anything that we've not talked about that you would like to add to this discussion that you would like to um, share with the museum and other folks who might see this. Well, when we were in Nevada, we were young. We were adventuresome. And there was a very, very good esprit de corps among all the people that I knew. We worked hard, we depended on one another, and frankly, it was one of the most exhilarating experiences of my life. Now, some of us got burnt, literally, uh, but we thought we were invulnerable. Nothing could ever happen to us, well, okay. But it was a great experience and I wouldn't trade it for a million years. Great, thank you very much. You're welcome.